Extending knowledge has been one of the main focus points of the IMRB since the beginning and sharing ideas and new opinions and looking across borders uh, to some extent and that's why I picked a topic that is not so much into the mining from the first glance but has come actually become a really big topic in the fire service industry. And I'm going to have a look at how that applies to mining as well and what we can take from it. The topic I'm talking about is basically cancer awareness for first responders. And that's due to the fact that medical studies have shown a strong increase in cancer, uh, cancer cases within fire departments during and after effective duty. The cause usually is seen in the first responders' exposure to various hazardous substances, but especially smoke and the toxins that are in there. Because of the new modern materials, they contain a lot more hazardous mix of gases and particles in the fire than before. And these substances cannot only be inhaled, but also absorbed by the skin. And that is why a lot of organizations have actually tackled this topic and begun to establish guidelines on this to how to combat that. Since 2007, the World Health Organization has acknowledged that. And also, uh, in several countries, certain types of cancer have become an occupational disease recognized for firefighters. So what substances are we talking about? That really depends on which kind of building you're talking to, if it's a surface structure, when it was built, and what's inside. You could have asbestos, you could have arsenic, you could have benzene, you have the common carbon monoxide, you have the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and you have vinyl chlorides. Overall, there have been analysis done that more than 400 different substances can be in those fire emissions. And a lot of them are carcinogenic. So there are some increased hazards, and all these materials, they are in insulation, they are in fuels, they are in paint, flooring, electrical equipment. And if you look at mines, it's not only underground, but you also have surface structures. Or if you look at a truck, huge rubber tire, if that burns, it creates a lot of sm toxic smoke. Looking into the future, what will become another topic as well, and where can we see new trends? Battery electric vehicles are coming into the game. Um, there was a study done, a research project in, in Switzerland, and that was actually regarding cars in tunnels. They uh, investigated how their tunnels can handle the fire of an electric car. And they established that actually the tunnels were pretty good because they had sufficient ventilation and extraction from a car fire. But they also saw that there were huge con concentrations of heavy metals from cobalt and manganese from the battery, of course, and also lithium in the form of aerosols. And if you bring that into a less ventilated place, they were even going over the IDLH um, uh, threshold limits. That they derived that from calculations and models. So better chemistry may even add to that hazard, but it also, and that's important to know, it depends on the battery technology used because battery chemistry, of course, determines what's inside the battery and what's inside the battery gets out. So that is one topic where also a lot of manufacturers so far have not really supplied a lot of information about these new, new hazards that come along. So we've talked about the substances. How do they get into the body? And I mean, there's four, four ways, ingestion, inhalation, eye contact, and skin contact. Three of those, basically, in the face, we can control really easy in a fire due to the mask that we wear and the SCBA or CCBA. What we don't, can't really fight that much in a fire is the skin contact. Because in a hazmat incident, yes, you can wear a suit, but going with that into a fire is not really applicable for an extended point of, uh, uh, period of time. What's also very important, the severity of the toxic effect is also dependent on the ambient temperature, for example. If you go in a hot environment, your skin opens up, so it takes more of these substances in. And usually when you fight fires or do your missions, ambient temperature is pretty high. So where, th where do we have these contamination risks in those uh, missions? You can even have it at training. If you're in a fire container or a flashover container, you get direct exposure to the substances. And all the clothes you wear, the helmet, the BA set, everything gets contaminated with those toxins. You have it in the incidents, pretty much exactly the same way. But you also have to look at your readiness, as we call it, 
the, the logistic process behind. So the people that maintain the equipment after an incident, they touch all of that equipment that gets back to the workshop. And of course, they get exposed to that. Fortunately, there have been, has already been done a lot of work on this. Uh, so how to combat that and how to tackle that, these kind of risks. So, for example, there's an uh, International Firefighter Cancer Foundation. There's uh, several guidelines from the Netherlands, from New Zealand, and one which is also very, very far uh, or good established is the Swedish firefighter model, which is the Healthy Firefighters um, project. Um, this was developed in a pretty small, actually, uh, Swedish fire service the, in Schellefteå. So if I mention that again, that's a small Swedish district actually where they developed that model. And it's basically a guideline of sets of, of uh, a set of actions that you can take. And some are very progressive, very strict, some are a little bit less. So there's a lot of things where you can take a look at and see what applies to your, your uh, situation and your, um, yeah, what applies to your operations. So that you don't have to read all this all at once right now, I will make a short summary of the steps that they have included, because, for example, the firefight, Healthy Firefighter booklet is about 90 pages. Um, what about training? So what can we do there? One topic that can be done is, for example, applying cleaner training methods. So, for example, gas fuel systems, because they just burn less dirty and create less toxins. So only use wood fuel systems in the training when the goal cannot be otherwise achieved. So you really have to look at the training. What do I really want to do with that training? And do I need to burn rubber or plywood, which creates a lot of um, toxins? And also here, treat contaminated materials, so everything that the people wear afterwards with extreme care and limit exposure of people to that that's, um, equipment. So there's various systems and they can be engineered in various shapes and forms and sizes up to an airplane. So there's no reason why that couldn't be a mine truck as well. So conclusion from this, clean but realistic training allows to reduce the exposure to harmful substances to trainees and trainers. And I think that's a very important point. Actually, I was at a training facility for mine, fire, for mine fires uh, some time ago. And uh, they, for example, stored all the actually exposed equipment in the same rooms with the clean equipment. And of course, that doesn't really make sense at that point. So what can you do in an incident? I mean, in an incident, it's pretty clear you wear your BA set. Um, but it's very important that you also select equipment that, after, that will A, take less contaminated uh, water or the, the smoke up and onto the equipment so that you can do, for example, with, with repellent or low absorption materials because that will really facilitate the service task. So if you have a harness that really takes up a lot of uh, water and a lot of smoke, that of course is always very difficult to, um, to clean afterwards. Wear PPE and breathing protection for as long as possible. I will come back to that a little bit later so that you uh, don't get uh, the the toxins from your clothes, for example, in your, your um, airways. Transport contaminated equipment in closed bags or boxes so that you don't throw in all the dirty stuff in your truck and then the truck is all dirty and you kind of have a chance that it gets uh, into all the seats and everything else. And on site, what you can also already do is perform a like, basic pre-decontamination and personal hygiene so that you already wash down the, the equipment and the, the turnout gear on site with water. When you fire the fire, you always have water, usually. So that's some of the equipment that can be used at that point. Conclusion, avoid as much contamination to teams and equipment as possible during the incident. Perform pre-decontamination and the monitoring and entering of cold fire sites. And that's also a very important topic. Cold fire sites are often underestimated. There have been several people that actually were killed because they were walking in or going into cold fire sites and there were still a lot of toxins coming up. 
that leads to a side topic. This is not related so much to cancer, but also to the healthy firefighter topic, the toxic twins. It has been also shown in studies, and it's pretty clear because CO and HCN work in a very different way. They both block the oxygen uptake into the system. So basically, they both work in the same way and are cumulative in, in their effects. So they can disorient firefighters and attack their, their uh, nervous system as well. Why is that important? Because usually when you do the gas detection on that, you have on your gas monitors a threshold limit effect, a threshold limit. But of course, that only counts for that one gas. And if you both have both working in the same way, actually the threshold limit value is lower. So you have to take that into account. And if you, it's basically the same as if you go into the bar and you know I can drink two beers to get to, my, to, my, to the driving legal limit, or I could have three glasses of wine, it's not sensible to drink one and a half beers and two and a half glasses of wine and think you're below the limit. No, they work in the same way, you go above that limit. So, if both gases are present, the alarm threshold for each gas needs to be lower. So that's what we do in that respect is that in all of our gas detectors now, we implement a, a function that you can activate that if you have both sensors applied and the, the function activated, that it calculates automatically both signals into one kind of and gives you a combined signal alarm. So what can be done on the readiness side of things? So the logistics cha uh, chain. Carefully really evaluate your cleaning and inspection processes. Clean PPE routinely after use at any incident. So what they recommend is really not making any difference that a person in the workshop has to decide, oh, this is only a little bit dirty and this one is a lot dirty. No, clean everything. And do it really carefully and treat contaminated material with care and, again, limit exposure to it. Don't mix it with the cleaned equipment. The best way would be to not do it in the same room, actually. Or have a kind of a process in place that you go from, from one stage to the other. Use suitable PPE when working with contaminated equipment. So if you have someone that is working almost full time on cleaning contaminated stuff and he gets that stuff out of the boxes or the bags and shakes it and whatever, you can re that can release a lot of the toxins. So you don't want to get that into your, your workshop environment. So these are some pictures actually from a from an fire service in the Netherlands where we have concluded a project some time ago and they have really gone on a very, very high level. I mean, not everyone has to do that, but they are doing that full time and they were really concerned about that topic. So what you can see is they wear PPE on why they unpack the equipment, they store everything in boxes, they get it into the cleaning process with the guy wearing actually a pepper because they say it's a carcinogenic substance. They put the whole room under, a, under pressure to keep to suck all the toxins out and not that it can spread into other rooms. So they have, I would say they have driven it really to the, to the top, but it shows um, that that can be established. And actually, the, the fire department of New York recently had a visit to that small Netherlands district to just have a look at the workshop, and that kind of tells you something. If the big guys are suddenly looking at smaller, smaller districts about what can be done. So, don't forget to protect also the people cleaning and handling contaminated equipment afterwards and, and the clothing. So, a lot of fire service up to now, even though I think it kind of applies to mining as well. And there was also something I didn't really see it in the mining industry. And then at some point I came across a video from Rio Tinto actually. And what they describe what they are doing, and it's called the Barrio system, is pretty much exactly what they do with, for example, the Swedish model. On a more, let's say, a practical way, but they call it the best practice airborne contaminants risk reduction initiative and operation. And um, they have thankfully allowed me to share that with you because they said it's really important. Yes, you can use our material and here's some more. So they were really willing to share that, that information that they put together. So what they do, they have evaluated a lot of tools and operating procedures and implemented them in their, their operation. And also 
put out a new set of modernized equipment because there's also studies that newer turnout gear, for example, can keep actually quite a bit of these toxins away from the body as opposed to in the past. So with that system, they won in 2018 the Systems and People Award by the Department of Mines, Industry, Regulation and Safety in Western Australia. So that's a pretty new topic for them as well. So what do they do? They perform after an incident, they perform an on-scene decontamination, they bag all the SCBA equipment, then uh, make a personal uh, decontamination where they wash themselves, they don disposable overalls to keep basically uh, everything away from them, and then they return all the equipment in bags to their, to their facility and then overhaul them there. And you can see that on the pictures, First, the on-scene decontamination, they doff the SCBA and then actually put a P2 respirator on it because while they are taking off the cloth, you can, could breathe in some more toxins. They don nitro gloves so that when they pack it in and touch it, that they don't get anything on their skin. And then they put it into a bag. You can see how he is standing on a kind of a big bag and then they put everything together. What they do then is that they stow it in lockers on that truck. They don't take it into the cab. They clean the hoses because they don't want that as well in their workshop. They carry out personal cleaning, for example, with some, some wipes to get it off their skin. Return to the station, take everything out. Again, put on PPE, put it in the washing machine, do the washing. Afterwards, let it dry and also allow their garments to dry. Then they clean the truck and they have to shower within one hour because, as everyone knows, who has been in a fire container or something, uh, how long that sticks on you and basically on the skin, and um, that shows you how, um, yeah, how important that is to get that off your body. And then, basically, they log all that in a uh, yeah, documentation and... and uh, kind of document what they have done with the equipment and which equipment was used and how it's being um, done. So, I'm already quite early, but the conclusion from that is, studies show an increased risk of cancer for first responders due to an increased exposure to airborne contaminants. SOPs and guidelines exist to significantly reduce the exposure during and after an incident, but also during the training and the logistic chain. A lot of measures can already be implemented by changing processes and with a limited budget that can be extended to a complete system. And that is one of the topics that the founder of the Swedish model, I met him two, two three weeks ago, actually by coincidence, um, he really stressed, you don't need a lot of budget, you don't need a lot of money, you don't have to uh, build a lot new. They started with a 10 square meter room and basically went from there. Having some P2 masks, having some, some bags for the equipment, having some nitro gloves is not going to break the bank. What he said is the main focus point for that is implementing a culture to support it. Because in the past what you usually see is the guy with, a, with the blackest helmet and the dirtiest clothes is the coolest guy because he has been fighting the most fires in, of the whole team. And that's basically, that has to change. It needs to be five people with really clean gear and one guy that is then the odd man out because he didn't do it. It is really about people understanding, having the awareness, what the hazards are, why, why that is being done. And then basically you can take a step-by-step -step approach. He said, don't, don't shoot for the, for the moon in the first go. Take it step-by-step, -step, develop it from there, learn from what you do, and then progress from there. And with that, I want to close with the everyone home safe, but I would like to add and healthy, because first responders already give so much, I don't think they should be giving up their health as well in the long term. Thank you for that. I have, oh, I have included, uh, because I know that presentations are normally shared, some of the resources uh, that I've used as links in the presentation. So there's a handbook for the Swedish model, the uh, link for the tunnel safety project. Unfortunately, the full report is German, but there's some summaries in, in English and French. Um, we have some resources on that on our fire services websites, uh, a lot of knowledge material. 
and the links to the Rio Tinto um, system presentation and the video. And if you want, you can contact me and I can link, hook you up to the, the person at, at Rio Tinto that has been developing this. I'm sure he will be happy to help anyone out. Thank you very much. <laughs>